they're so good, they're so good. Incredibly undoll at CBG. If you're new, welcome. My name is David. I'm one of the pastors. And uh, this weekend, we are honoring the students. And I want to dedicate this message to the teachers, especially the teachers of the sensational subject of geography. Give it up for geography. (laughs) If you watched online, like maybe a dozen people politely clapping. Okay, listen, geography is awesome. I love geography. It's a synergistic subject. You know, you study not just the boundaries and the borders of nations, but you study topography and you study a world history and sociology and cultures and diversity. So I love me some geography. So for the geography teachers watching online or here in the room, this message is dedicated to you. And perhaps if you're doing here first semester, a study of river systems, there's 165 major rivers in the world, 76 over a thousand miles. Well, maybe if you're studying rivers in geography, you should take a field trip. To the Jungle Cruise. You should go to the Jungle Cruise. Take your students to the Jungle Cruise at Disney World or Disneyland. In fact, they have Jungle Cruises at all the global parks. Uh, And I would tell you the reason why is the Jungle Cruise traverses the great rivers of the world. I think it's the Zambezi, the Congo, the Mekong in uh, Asia, the Nile River, and the Amazon. That's 10,000 miles of waterway, all in seven and a half minutes. That'd be a great field trip. So take your class to Disneyland or Disney World. Now, full disclosure, if you're watching online in some faraway place, you're watching right now in Nebraska or Nepal, our campuses are in South Florida, and I love Disney like many people in South Florida. I do Disney often, but people in South Florida, we don't do Disney this time of year because it's August. And in August, we recognize that Disney World is not the happiest place on earth. It's what? It's the the hottest place on earth, maybe the most humid place on earth. So I love Disney in December. Give me Disney in January. In February, it is fine, but not in August. So in lieu of that trip, we have this facsimile of the Jungle Cruise on the stage. Uh, So I want to play the part of the Jungle Cruise skipper. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll pass on the bad puns and the dad jokes. Though I love someone who tells a bad joke really well. That's a skill to tell a bad joke really well. And those captains do that. I love that on the ride. But we'll walk you through a series of rivers. You see, if you're new to this study, Jungle Cruising, we're studying the theme of water in the Bible, water. Now, if you're a history teacher, you recognize the people of the biblical age in that culture, that climate, water was a big deal. Why? It's arid, it's desert. Without water, your crops fail. Your, uh, your herds die. Your family may not survive. So water in the Bible is a big thing. So water became symbolic of what? God's provision. God's goodness, God's favor, God's blessing. So water is a powerful symbol and image in the Bible. And then also some of the coolest stories in the Bible are set in the environments of rivers. So again, with this new mystery series coming up September 12th, I I don't have time for every river story. So what I want to do today is consolidate and take you on a river cruise. We're going to hit several rivers in the Bible. I want you to take notes, by the way. Take notes. Uh, The academics in the room, the teachers will tell you this research that if you take notes, you retain five times better if you write something down. So take out your phones. I'm looking at you right now. Take out your phones. Humor me. Pretend like you're taking notes. But if you do, you enjoy this topic more. If you're watching online, take a few notes. Hey, listen, I love a paper Bible for that reason. I have a big paper Bible with a pen. I take notes in the margin. I date it, by the way. It's a great resource. Hey, one of the few reasons to kill a tree is for a paper Bible. That's one thing you can do. So let's journey through some of the rivers of the Bible. Let's start at the beginning. Let's go to Genesis chapter 2, and we'll start with a river you might not know about. There's a river in the Garden of Eden. A river in the Garden of Eden. You thought, wow, David, I thought there was a tree and like an apple and a serpent and some fig leaves, right? But there's, there's a river? There is a river. When you think of the river in Eden, think of this idea, origin story. Origin story. Of course, Genesis is the story of the origin of the universe and the origin of life and God making humanity. So it's, if God made Adam and Eve, it's the, if it's their origin story, listen, it's also your origin story. Like every hero, you have an origin story. All right, now, I just lost some science teacher in the room. There's a science teacher or biology teacher or physics teacher watched online. You're about to log off. Don't log off. Don't log off. because you're, you're freaking out a little bit. You're thinking, David, I mean, you have an education. You have a master's degree. You believe in the historicity of Genesis. You believe that God really made the universe and made Adam and Eve. You really believe that stuff? And you want to tap out, stay with me. Short answer is yes, I believe that stuff. But listen, listen, don't, don't log off. Stay with me if you're scientifically minded. I believe you can reconcile both a scientific framework and a biblical worldview. Yes. Stay with me. 
stay with me. Science people, don't, now don't you roll your eyes, science teacher. Don't you start scrolling your phone. You hate when your students do that. Give me a little latitude. Stay with me. I'm going to circle back around in a moment, but just, just humor me. If it is true, if Genesis is the origin story, something powerful is taking place. Let me show you on the screen. Let's go to Genesis 2, and the word river shows up. Once you read it loudly, ready? It comes quick. Ready? One, two, three. Uh, river. Come on, one o'clock. Y'all slept in today, right? Y'all slept in. You've had plenty of caffeine. You're well rested. We're going to try it again a little louder, class. Ready? One, two, three. Uh, river. There you go. A uh, river. Put river in the chat if you will. River water in the garden flowed from Eden. From there, it separated into four headwaters. The name of the first was Pishon. It winded through the entire land of Havilah, where there is gold. Uh, verse 13, the name of the second river is Gihon. It winds through the entire land of Cush. The name of the third river is the Tigris. It runs along the east side of Asher. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord took the man, Adam, and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. All right, lots of information here. So there's this river in Eden that breaks into four smaller rivers. Now, the first two we don't recognize. Pishon and Gihon, those names have been lost in antiquity. But the other rivers you probably recognize, especially if you like geography like me, you recognize the name the Tigris. The Tigris is a long river. It's 1,150 miles long, approximately. It runs through modern-day Iraq. And then the Euphrates is just east of the Tigris. They kind of have a parallel pathway. It's a very famous river, 1,700 miles or so in length. And you'll recognize, if you know your history of humanity, very important region. This is Mesopotamia. It's where we believe that humanity and culture began, that culture, the civilization, if you will, began. And what made the Fertile Crescent fertile? These two rivers. So irrigation for crops was possible. So here's the crazy thing. The author of Genesis is saying Eden, this paradise, is not mythology. It's not a fairy tale. Here's the geography of what really happened. So stay with me. You say, don't log off of your scientifically minded prayer. I get it. Listen, stay with me. If it is true, if God designed and made Adam and Eve, if God made the universe, if God created humanity, if God made Adam and Eve, he made you. And stay with me, young person, stay with this student. If God bioengineered you, that means you have incredible intrinsic value. Because God gave his cosmic genius into making you just the way you are. And God never makes a mistake. God esteems you. You have worth. I know you're in middle school and no one wants to sit at your table. Who cares what they think? God designed you. You're made by Almighty God who spoke the stars into existence. So you have value, you have intrinsic worth. Let me drill down even more. In Genesis, it also says that humanity, the people, were the only thing in all the creative order made in God's own image. It said that God, when he made people, he made them male and female in his divine image. Now, that's a remarkable thought if you think about it, because God made other wondrous stuff. I mean, God made, think about it, he made giant California redwoods, and he made, you know, giant uh, blue whales. He made other smart animals like chimpanzees and dolphins. But you're different. You're unique. God made a beautiful mountain ranges and, and sunsets. Speaking of suns, he made galaxies and solar systems and supernovas. All awesome. But none of those made in God's own image except you. So you feel like you don't matter, don't have worth, you don't count. You are divinely made. You are custom crafted by the maker of the universe. You have value. Now... Scientists, 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 stay, stay with me, stay with me, stay, listen, listen. You're like, okay, preacher, really? Wow, Adam and Eve, made by God, what about, okay, listen. The, the talk is not how today, how you reconcile science and scripture, but I believe you can. I believe you can. And so, listen, you understand faith, the way we teach faith at Church by the Glades, faith is not anti-intellectual. What I don't want you to do ever at Church by the Glades is park your brain in the lobby and come in and believe what I say. God wants you thinking. When Jesus was asked, hey, what's your father looking for? What's God looking for? He said, love. He wants love. Here's how you love God with a holistic person of who you are. Love God with your heart, soul, mind. And so you can bring your questions in here. This is a safe place to ask your God questions. We're never offended by an honest God question. By the way, God is not offended by an honest God question. God's highly secure. Your question will not knock him off his throne. So bring your questions, bring your objections, but do your homework. 
And so this service is not about, you know, this, this message is not about how you reconcile the Bible and science, but I believe you can. It's not easy. It does not perfectly align, but you can get there. Now, I did teach on that not too long ago. If you recall, a series called Managing Your Monsters. Remember Managing Your Monsters? We had a, a dino theme here on stage. Uh, by the way, just a little sidebar. May I interrupt myself? I do things like that. Let me chase a rabbit right now. So what is church without dinosaurs or giant ships on stage, right? It's creativity. A teacher is just a thought. If you're like, man, kids are so hard to teach these days because due to social media and stuff, they have the attention span of a gnat. You just kind of come to your class now and you feel defeated. You just download information. Teachers this year infuse creativity into your teaching. Work hard to capture their attention. I know your audience, your class are distracted. Mine is too. But we do things like this. All these stage shenanigans for 23 years is using imagination to capture their attention. Do that. Listen, you can be sensational and substantial at the same time. Some people think church by the glaze must be shallow because of all this stuff. No, I actually teach the Bible at a rather sophisticated level. I teach you doctrine. I just don't tell you. And when you come out here and do a Tina Turner cover first, guess what? You all laugh and you cheer and you drop your defenses. And I can teach you. So teachers, man, channel your best Robin Williams at Dead Poet Society. And this year, bring imagination. Bring imagination to the classroom. Amen? Don't just download content, data. Get their attention if you possibly can. Okay, what was I talking about? <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, uh, so how do you reconcile the scripture and science? So I taught about that during a series called Managing Your Monsters. Because I beg the question, how do you fit dinosaurs into the Bible? How do you reconcile paleontology and the scripture? So in week five, it was on Mother's Day. You can go to our website and get this resource for free. Uh, I think 18 minutes into the talk, I dealt with that idea. And so I called the sermon a sermon for smart people because your mama is smart. And so I believe you can. you got to wrestle with it, but you can. You can be both a smart person with a scientific framework and still value the Word of God, even the historicity of Genesis. And if it, listen, I'm not a scientist. I get it. I'm not a physicist. I get it. But I put on the screen during that series a whole bunch of the great minds of the generations, people like this right here, some of the great thinkers of all time. We're talking about Kepler and Marconi and Oh my gosh, Galileo and Newton and of course Schrodinger and, and Heisenberg, great minds. All these people were theistic people. They all believed in the God of Scripture. If they can get there, you can get there. First river isn't Eden, Genesis. Let's go to Exodus. Let's go to Exodus. We give you a second river here quickly. Let's pick up the pace on the cruise. So let's go to Exodus. We'll be in chapter two. Let's go to the Nile River. The Nile River. Now, the Nile River, if you like uh, geography like me, the Nile River uh, starts uh, somewhere in the area of Tanzania, Rwanda. There's a large lake called Lake Victoria, and it meanders 4,123 miles. It's the longest river in the world. It dumps out in the Mediterranean Ocean and there at the country of Egypt. So let's go to Egypt. Some of the coolest Bible stories are set in the stage of Egypt, especially stories by a guy named Moses. Now, when you think about the story of Moses and the Nile, think this word, this word, think purpose, think purpose. When I say three, shout the word purpose. Ready? One, two, three. Purpose. Come on louder. One, two, three. Because obviously God had infused this little boy's life with divine purpose. It's a famous story, but let's read the first part. Now we'll go to the next book in the Bible. Here we're journeying down the cruise, right? We're rolling down the river like the great theologian Tina Turner told us to do. And it says in Exodus chapter two on the screen right now, a woman became pregnant. This is Moses' mama, gave birth to a son. She saw that he was a special. He's special, baby. all mama thought he was special. Mama thought that baby was special. Guess what every mama does, right? But the Bible confirms she was right. If you jump over to say New Testament, Acts chapter seven, verse 20, it says that he was no ordinary child. If you cross-reverence Hebrews 11, I think verse 23, it says that this baby Moses was beautiful in the eyes of God. By the way, every baby is beautiful in the eyes of God. God thinks every baby, God values life. God values babies. I wish I had time to preach on that. Like two happy people who like babies. I, me too, I'd be clapping if I was out there. Babies are awesome. But it says, a special baby, she kept him hidden for three months, verse three, but when she could no longer hide him, sometimes God's doing a work so big you cannot contain it. Sometimes God's going to work in your life or family so big you just can't hide it if you wanted to. He couldn't hide him. She got a basket made of papyrus reeds and waterproofed it with tar and pitch. And then she put the baby in the basket and laid it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile River. So it's, it's a river story. So she puts the baby in a basket and, and puts the basket in the river. Now, this is not shocking because you've heard this story before. 
I mean, Hollywood's made multiple movies about this famous story. But guess what? If you saw this going down in your neighborhood, your neighbor's putting the baby in a basket, puts a, ba a basket in the canal. You call, call, you call Child Protective Services, right? You're just like, that's crazy. Why would any sane, caring mother do this to her baby? Answer, there's a bully in the story. The bully's name is Pharaoh. History teaches what Pharaoh, we're not exactly sure, probably Seti the first, maybe Ramses the first. But this, whoever the Pharaoh was, he's a megalomaniac. He's homicidal. He is genocidal. He thinks infanticide is a just means of population control. We learn in the chapter before the Hebrews, though enslaved, are growing in number. They're still blessed by God, though in bondage. He wants to wipe some out, so he, he enacts a law that every baby boy is to be assassinated. That's why she's hiding her baby boy. There's a bully. A little sidebar, I love we've taken steps on our campuses to keep our kids safe from bullies, even online to protect them from bullies. That's a good thing. Young people, if someone bullies you this year, please tell your parents. I know it's awkward and weird and little, but bring mom and dad, they love you, into the loop on this. Then parents, you probably need to bring it up with the teacher or the administration. Uh, and by the way, if you are bullying someone, if you're the bully, stop it. Yeah. Yeah. If you're the bully, are you kidding me? Yeah. You think you're cool because you're, you're oppressing somebody? Because you're stronger than somebody? Man, the Bible says mean people suck. Okay, not really, but it should, right? Stop it. It is sin. It is wrong. It's childish. It's immature. So if you're being bullied, man, tell somebody. Tell somebody. I love we taking these steps. But you know, funny thing is, no matter how pervasive our policy is to protect kids from bullying, there's no way to eradicate bullies from the world. They're still there, right? We get rid of all the bullies in school. There's no bullies in the classrooms or the lunchrooms or the locker room. You're still going to meet a bully someday in the boardroom. Some colleague or supervisor or competitor is going to slander you, malign you, cheat, right? Uh, how about online? People say mean bullies say things on your comments all the time to hurt you. They're, they're out, you talk about history and geography. There are world leaders right now who are bullies. There's dictators and tyrants and world leaders. They're, they're bullies. They're, they're out there. Now, here's the good news. If you encounter a bully, now protect yourself the best you can. But if you meet a bully, know this. God is bigger than your bully. But God is so awesome. In the Bible, you see countless examples of God actually leveraging the bully to refine the hero. Right? He uses the bully to make the hero stronger or, or more resolved or grow in his grit, right? Or, or actually to, to reveal the hero. Pastor Ed Young says, sometimes your bully is your pulley. Now, a pulley raises something up. Your bully is a thing that God will use to present you to the world, to show the world your skill set or your uniqueness. Think with me. Uh, Joseph had a bully named Potiphar. And uh, Gideon had bullies named the Amalekites. And, and, and David, 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 little shepherd boy, had the ultimate biblical bully. I had, had a six foot, nine inch Philistine, trash talking, anger issue giant named Goliath trying to kill him. Right. Not saying mean things online, trying to take his head out. But listen, nobody even knew who David was. David was an anonymous, nameless shepherd, a bumpkin from Bethlehem, till he faced his giant. He faced down his bully, and he defeated his bully, and dispatched his bully, and decapitated his bully. And after that, the whole world literally is singing David's praises. God can even use your bully. So this mom, because she has a bully, does something desperate. Listen, sometimes it's good to be desperate. Next week, I'm going to show you a, a desperate man who's willing to try some new things. Next week, this guy innovates. He's, gonna, he's open to God in a way he's never been before. Why? Because sometimes it's good to be a little desperate. I know it's scary and frustrating, but she gets desperate. So she puts her baby, her baby in this basket. Why? She thought he was special. She thought God had purpose for him. God had a plan for him. So she wants to protect that purpose. And so when I think about purpose, I think about protection. And I think of position, position. When I say the word three, shout the word position. Ready? One, two, three. Position. Think about it. Again, the problem of the story is it's familiar. And familiar things become cliche. Lose the power. Think again. Here's this lady, and she puts her baby, her beloved baby, her special baby, in a basket. Then she places the basket in the river at just the right place, at just the right time. Why? Because God will position you for purpose. Think about what takes place. Again, this, this story is it's not random. This is remarkable. That little basket placed in the river by the mom at just the right time and just the right place. All of a sudden, there's just the right current driven by just the right tide, just the right gentle breeze nudging this basket to just the right place. Uh, maybe just the right wake from a fishing boat passing by, just the, a nudge from a nosy crocodile. That sometime and some distance later, that, that, that little basket lands exactly where 
Pharaoh's daughter, a princess, is bathing. Why is she bathing in the river? Answer, no one's invented indoor plumbing yet. She has attendants. What are the attendants doing? They're watching for those crocodiles. They spot the basket. She didn't go get it. She sends a servant. And then I love biblical detail. When they bring the basket up and here's the little baby inside, she recognizes right away it's a Hebrew baby. There's no mystery to this. She recognizes, oh, this, this is a baby doomed by my daddy's decree to die. And the Bible says in that moment, just the right time, just the right place, Moses cries. The baby, and it breaks her heart. It's like God sent a little invisible angel to pinch him on his chubby little thigh. Just the right moment, just the right moment. Cry. And she adopts him. My prayer for you, student, throughout this year, you'll be in just the right place at just the right time to learn, to grow, to achieve, to get better, to, to make good friends. Just the right time, just the right place to be someone's friend. I want you to go to school with this assignment. Part of your purpose this year, you look for somebody who's alone. You look for some kid eating lunch by themselves. Go be their friend. Go be, oh, but they're not cool, man. I'll lose street cred. Shut up. You're not that cool anyways. Go be their friend. Make that part of your mission. Invite them to your church. Amen? Uh, right time, right, right time. And here's crazy. So he ends up, he ends up growing in the palace. So I love God's purpose. God will position you for purpose. God will protect the purpose. Now, what was the purpose? Why? Let's think about this. Some of y'all know this story. Like, I can learn nothing new about this story. Okay, here's a new thing for you. Why did God have Moses grow up in the palace? Now, you would assume if you're part of Moses' family back when this happened, oh, God, my gosh, Moses is going to grow up in, in the household of Pharaoh. Why? No doubt as he gets older, he can exercise his influence. And, and maybe Pharaoh will listen to him because he's going to be in the royal family and, and there'll be a change in political policy and Pharaoh will emancipate the slaves. So he's no doubt in the palace to, to use political means to free the slaves. Logical. Never happens. It's in the palace. Now, he's not in line for the throne like in the movies, but he's part of the royal family. He knew the Pharaoh, right? But that never happened. So if he tried it, it never worked. So why, why, why? What is God's purpose in that season for Moses being in the palace? Okay, I got to go to the New Testament for this. I love biblical detail. Acts chapter 7, verse 22 is on the screen. It's talking about Old Testament heroes and gives us a beautiful, delicious detail about Moses. It says, Moses was educated. <laughs> That's why he was there. He's getting his education and all the wisdom of the Egyptians. Listen, see, the Egyptians had the greatest universities of the world at that time. Uh, they understood architecture, engineering. Think about the pyramids. Think about their, their tombs. I mean, they, could, they, could build, they had written language, hieroglyphics. They invented paper technology. All it was Egypt. They had, a, they had a library in Alexandria without rival in the world, one of the marvels of the ancient world. He had access to education. So part of God's purpose in that season was his education. It was a season, a purposeful season of preparation. Students, I'm sure God has all kinds of multifaceted, wonderfully diverse purposes for your life. But one thing happening right now, this is your season of preparation. Press into your education. Education is a blessing in your life. Aren't you glad you brought your kid to church today to hear this? Maybe the kids aren't that glad, but I'm telling you, it's, education is your friend. Think about it. Moses is one of the greatest leaders in the history of the world. Put him up there with Abraham Lincoln and George Washington and Churchill and Nelson Mandela and, and MLK. I mean, one of the great leaders in history. Forget the Bibles of just the impact. He emancipated two million people. That is leadership. But great leaders, leaders at times early in their life typically press into their education. They're diligent students. They're not all great students. Sometimes they have to go to bad school. Sometimes they have to self-educate. A few have learning issues but they take advantage of education. Moses, he leads in Hebrew. He leads the Hebrews out of bondage, but his early life is Egyptian. He, learns, he has to learn a second language to be successful. He does it. Purpose. Purpose is powerful, powerful. Positioned, and by the way, the same way God, listen, students, the same way God had a purpose for Moses, he has a purpose for you. See, God does not just reserve this idea of purpose for like Bible people like Moses had a purpose and Elijah had a purpose and John the Baptist had a purpose and Peter had a purpose. No, no, no. Everybody he makes, and he made you. You're bioengineered by God. You have an origin story. Everybody he makes, he infuses with divine purpose. And every purpose is powerful and unique. God has a divine dream for your life. God wants to make his dream come true. Now, he didn't give a rip about your dream. 
well, I want to play in the NBA and then be a rapper and then be a millionaire and be on TV and have influence. Great. I hope that happens for you. But God will make his dream come to pass in your life. Maybe your dreams will intersect like a river. Maybe they won't. But guess what? Don't be disappointed because God's dream is a huge upgrade. In fact, I want you to fall in love with it. I want you to recognize, oh my gosh, God who's like really, really smart, God who is a cosmic genius, God who knows all information, past, present, and future, has scripted a purpose for my life. I want that. I want every bit of that. I want every bit of impact and legacy, every, every gifting, every opportunity. I want God to position me. I, I want that. In fact, that purpose is something I want to pursue with such passion. I will protect God's purpose in my life. I mean this. I know I can damage or destroy God's purpose in my life. God won't force it on me. I get a, I get a partner with God, and I, I can mess up. So I'm not going to sacrifice God's purpose on the altar of sin or stupidity or sexuality or substance. I am a young man or a young woman of divine destiny. And right now, this is my purpose and my season of education. I'll protect it. We got to move on. Got to move the cruise. Let's go to another body of water. Let's go to uh, from the Nile. Let's stay with Moses. Though. But now he's an old guy. Now he's an octogenarian. He's 80 years young. And he starts leading the people out of bondage. He says, after the 10 plagues, we'll go to uh, from the Nile River. Let's go to the Red Sea. Let's go to the Red Sea. Now, I can see the fact the Red Sea is not a river. It's an inlet of water off the Indian Ocean. But it's a barrier. So when you think about the Red Sea, think two ideas. Number one, think freedom. Think freedom. When I say three, shout the word freedom. Ready? One, two, three. Come on, it's a good word. Shout it louder than that. One, two, three. Freedom. Freedom. Why? Because God loves to set people free. If you're new to the whole God thing, wonder what God's agenda is for you. Easy. Freedom. Wants to set you free every way a person can be set free. Set you free spiritually. Set you free eternally. Set you free relationally. Set you free habitually. Set you free, you name it, financially. And whom the Son has set free is free indeed. Wants to set you free, wants to set you free. All right, set you free. So it's going to be, see, once they cross the Red Sea, they're free from the Egyptians. It's going to protect them. It's going to be like a watery barrier the Egyptians can hit. So once they get past that, but the problem is they're not past it right now. So right now, it's not freedom, it's a problem. So what's going to provide freedom right now presents as a problem. And by the way, it's not just one problem, there's two problems, because Pharaoh's had a change of heart, you're recalling. He thinks, oh my gosh, I just released my free labor force of two million people. Who's going to build my pyramids? So he sends his army aggressively after the Israelites, no doubt to assassinate the leadership and take everyone back into bondage. So on one side, you got the Egyptian army. That is a problem. On the other side, you have the Red Sea, an impassable barrier. Listen, a barrier is always going to be between you and your blessing. A problem between you and your promised land every single time. So what do you do in this circumstance? You've got not one problem, but two problems. One's impossible and one's impassable. What do you do? You're in the God zone right there. You're in the perfect place for a miracle. Stay with me. We all pray and want miracles. How do miracles go down? Okay, every single biblical miracle. Are you taking notes on this? Take notes on Write this down. This is good stuff. All right, every single biblical miracle has two parts. God says, okay, I got my part, the God part, and then there's your part. There's a you part and there's a me part, God says. Okay, want a miracle? You go first. And every single time in the Bible, you'll see every time there's a miracle, something that precedes it, I call a faith action step. That a man or a woman or a group of people has to step out in faith. By the way, I'm going to show you next week, faith has nothing to do with your feelings. Faith has nothing to do with emotions. It's normally something you do, a decision you make, a commitment you're all about. So God says, you want a miracle? Okay, two parts, my part, your part. You go first. And you'll see only, you know, with intrepidation, if someone steps into this reality, then and only then God moves. See, God will not do for you what you can do for yourself. But only after you've done everything you can do for yourself, God will do for you what you cannot do for yourself. That's the territory of the miracle. We break it down. So students, you want a miracle in your academics, don't pray and ask God to give you an A when you've studied for a C. You tracking with me now? All right, so here they are between, you know, the rock and the hard place, the Egyptian army and the Red Sea. The Red Sea is a barrier. They got all this issue, right? So what's God going to do? Well, here's the two parts of the miracle. Let's go to a sensational passage. Again, most famous miracle probably of the Old Testament. Let's go to Exodus now, chapter 14, verse 13 and verse 14. On the screen behind me, here's what God tells them to do through Moses. Moses answered the people, do not be afraid, stand firm. That's your part. Stand firm. That's your action step. Stand firm. What, what David, uh, standing firm sounds, sounds kind of passive, inactive. Oh, when there's an army charging, 
to stand your ground, to not retreat, to not surrender. That's a huge action step. So people of God, you stay right there. You stay right there. And by the way, I want to point out as a sidebar, they're stuck, by the way, they're stuck. They're stuck between the Egyptian army and the Red Sea. Why are they stuck? Well, most times in my life, when I get stuck, I'm stuck because I've done something dumb or a series of dumb things. I've stepped or stumbled into sin. I made this huge mess of everything, kind of you know, fouled things up, and I find myself stuck. That's typically what happens, but sometimes in life you will get stuck doing exactly what God has called you to do. And in this story, they've been obeying God. God's been leading. In fact, this, this is way too happy. This is kind of a serious scene. Can you, can you guys change the ambiance in the room? Because this was scary. They, they never read the story. They never saw the movie by Spielberg. They didn't know Prince of Egypt happened. They, right? They're, 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 they're living this out. And here's the army and the Red Sea, and the army's going to take them back into bondage and kill the leadership and maybe destroy them. And so let's make it dark and foreboding. Nice job, production team. And they're stuck, not because they've disobeyed, but this time Israel's obeyed God perfectly, exactly, daily. God provided them guidance, you know, the pillar by day and the, the pillar of fire at night. They've been following. So God put them right in this stuck position between these two problems. But God says, okay, now, it looks bad. Here's your action step. Stand firm. Stand firm. I love this. And you will see the... I, I don't have time, but that detail is so delicious. This is for the literature teachers in the house that you love a good story. Because the story of the Bible, who's the main character? It's Jesus. So the New Testament, the Gospels, all about Jesus. The books after the Gospels all look back at Jesus. But the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, points towards Jesus, foreshadows Jesus. But it's subtle. Here's one of the places right here. This is so cool. This is the most famous miracle in all of Hebrew history. Biggest two verses, and right here tucked away, this word in Hebrew for deliverance is the Hebrew word Yahshua, Yahshua. Okay, a couple people get where I'm going here, for those who don't. So if you lived in the first century and you saw Jesus, he was your friend. You lived in the village of Nazareth, you saw Jesus, you wouldn't say, hey, Jesus, what's happening? Jesus, he wouldn't say, because Jesus was not really his name. Jesus is a Greek translation of his Hebrew name. His real Hebrew name is Yahshua. Yashu, deliverance. God is our Yahshua. So here tucked away in this verse is Jesus' name who will be the ultimate deliverance for all people of the world. Lead us all out of bondage. I love the foreshadowing of the Bible. The Egyptians you see today. I uh, wish I had more time. Egypt. They've seen Egyptians for 430 years. They've been oppressed by the Egyptians, enslaved by marginal. 400. You think you've been dealing with your problem a long time? You think your problems are possible because it's going on for a couple decades? Man, God's got you. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. Only need to be still. Did you take your action step? Have you walked in that water of sanctification last week? Have you taken that step? To just wait on God. God's, I, I got this. You're in the God zone right now. I'm going to move on your behalf. I'm going to give you victory. And so here we've got not just one problem, two problems, right? You with me? No one's complicated, confused, right? Got, yeah, the Egyptians, that's one problem. Red Sea's the other problem. So how is God? God uses, God is so, God, who but God can use one problem to swallow up the other problem? Then stay with me. Then the problem, you know the story, the problem becomes what? The problem of the Red Sea becomes the pathway. God is so incredible, he uses the problem to become the pathway. Then later, the problem becomes the platform, because 40 years later in the book of Joshua, and the people are going to take possession of the promised land, what are the Canaanites talking about? They're still talking about the whole Red Sea thing they heard about. Freedom. So you got problems. God's great with problems. Man, we're out of time. I'm out of time. I look at my clock, out of time. I had all these other rivers to talk about, the Kabar River in, in Babylon. That's a cool story. Or how about the Brook Kidron where, you know, Elijah is resourced during a drought by God supernaturally. God can meet your needs in a famine. Or how about, I mean, the Brook Kidron. Uh, how about the little valley, the stream in the Valley of Elah where David finds those five stones to kill Goliath. Where are the weapons for your victory? All these great, the Jordan. I forgot the Jordan River. That's the most important river in the whole Bible. How did I bypass the Jordan River? Next week, next week, when you come back to church by the glades, I have a great miracle that happens. Give it up for the Jordan River. It happens in the Jordan River. So please come back next week. Uh, all these other rivers, but let me just land, you know. Isn't it kind of funny if you go on the Jungle Cruise, you kind of like offload just right by where you started. The Bible has almost the same kind of story, the same kind of symmetry. So we start in paradise. And if you know Jesus, you finish in paradise. So let's go to the final, final, final chapter in your Bible. In Revelation chapter 22, Eden. 
Eden. There, there's a river in Eden. Maybe you didn't know that. So here it says in verse one on the screen right now, give me heaven, guys. Give me heaven up on the screen. I said, Eden, I'm at heaven. The angel showed me the river of water, the water of life, as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. So, you know, in heaven, I'm sure you envision heaven. One thing that's in heaven is this, this river of life. And uh, listen, the Bible only spends a few paragraphs describing the beauty of heaven. All I can tell you is this, heaven is an upgrade from anything and everything we experience on earth. When you're in heaven, you won't want to come back for anything. Uh, so, so I'm using Disney as my parable, my metaphor. I love Disney. I love Disney rides. In fact, I'm so obsessed with Disney. I, I kind of hate when the rides are over with the exception of small, small world. You know, I, I love every ride. In fact, there was a time in my life when I, I went back to school to work on another degree. This is, this is 25 years ago. And uh, I needed an income. I worked on a doctorate degree and I met this girl in my, my single young adult single group at another church, Charlie, the rally of that church named Lisa Evans named Lisa Hughes, and Lisa Evans was a talent agent at the time on South Beach, really good at her job. And she said, David, you can make money as an actor. I'm like, really? As an actor? And so I took some acting classes, and I worked for three years as a professional actor. I'm the only pastor with a SAG card. All right, now, if you want to know, hey, what was it like? Uh, okay, I was not competing with Denzel and Brad Pitt for leading man roles. Here in South Florida, you, it mainly was commercials. So you audition and hopefully book some commercials. And I did about 300 commercials in three years. So it was, it was made a living, had fun, it's kind of competitive, you play pretend for a living. Uh, so I did commercials for McDonald's, and I did commercials for Burger King and all the cruise lines, and I was the Wrangler jeans guy for a while, I mean, all that kind of silliness. Uh, but one of my best clients was Disney. So I did some Disney commercials, but typically if I worked for Disney, they booked me on a print job. And that means this, they, you know, you're like, you're the fake dad, and they find a model to be your fake wife and give you a couple fake kids, and they put you on a ride, typically. And they had a photographer there, and you just ride the ride over and over. So I had one time I rode test track like a dozen times, so they took pictures. Loved every single time around the circle. I, uh, Buzz Lightyear, Buzz Lightyear in Tomorrowland, rode that all night long, like 85 times. Loved every single time. I'm, I'm the way I love it. Never want to get off the ride. But when it comes to heaven, when this earthly ride is over, and I love people on this earth, I have people I cherish just like you. When you're in heaven, like a second and a half, you're thinking, man, I, I'm not sad to be off that ride. When you see your king face to face, when you get your first breath of that heavenly air, when you drink from the tree of the river of life. It's kind of like if you're ever sitting in that really bad seat on an airplane, that back row by the toilets where it smells bad, in the middle, doesn't recline, and the flight attendant says, hey, I'd like to bump you up, upgrade you to first class. When you're in first class, you're not missing that last row, are you? You're not, you're not as you're sipping your champagne, oh, I missed that middle seat, never. That's heaven. The only place this breaks down is this. Let me show you verse 17. Uh, a detail again in the Bible, I love this, about this river of life in heaven. It says, whoever is thirsty, let him come. Whoever wishes, let him take the free gift of the water. So it's, it's free. So here's where the whole Disney thing breaks down terribly. Because you've been to Disney, Disney's awesome, but nothing in Disney is free, right? They charge you for the parking, they charge you for the ticket, they charge you for your food, your drink. Almost every single ride ends where? Ends where? Ends in a gift shop to sell you more stuff, more merch, right? But God says all this paradise and all this perfection is free. Salvation is free. Don't have to work it up, earn it, surely don't pay for it. It's a free gift. Jesus paid the price. Reminds me of that great promise about salvation in Ephesians 2, 8, 9 on the big screen behind me right now. It says, right, grace, you have been saved through faith, and this is not of yourselves. It is the... Yes. If you've not received the free gift of salvation, make your move today. The river of forgiveness and life and salvation is available. Come on in. The water is fine. Make your decision today. Text the word salvation to the number on the screen. Make that move. The prayer partners will be here. Let me pray for you. Father God, thank you as I pretended to be a jungle cruise captain. As we navigate the biblical waters, it's my prayer that someone would taste of the river of life, the river of salvation, the river that flows in John chapter 7 from our spirit as we say yes to Jesus. Give someone that courage to make that decision. That's our prayer today in Jesus' name. Amen.